Whatever happened to electromagnetic tank armor? Imagine if an incoming RPG could be vaporized right when it touched your armor. This type of space age, Star Wars type force field has actually been in the works for over 20 years at various defense companies. In the early 2000s, the US military spent nearly $200 million across several years on this technology. Conventional armor offers only limited protection against RPGs and shape charges that shoot out a jet of hot copper at 5,000 miles per hour. It can penetrate around 600 millimeters of your tank armor, which means you need heavy, thick armor all around your tank. Meanwhile, electromagnetic armor would reduce your tank's total weight and give you the ability to stop multiple hits. So, how far away is this technology from being really adopted? Is electromagnetic armor practical, and what are its limitations? And what are the chances I get electrocuted by my vehicle's own armor here? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Slap the like and subscribe button with a big unironic hua, and let's find out. Here's how electromagnetic armor works. ELRA consists of two parallel conducting plates connecting to opposite poles of a charged high energy capacitor. They have a high voltage difference and are connected to an energy source between them. These plates are mounted on the basic armor. Basically the whole concept is when you're driving around in your tank doing normal operations, your high supercapacitor voltage power supply is charging your armor plates. When someone fires off an RPG round at you, the munition hits your electric armor and completes the circuit which discharges the incredible amount of stored energy, which is dumped into the munition, the enemy munition, and essentially vaporizes or liquefies it by causing it to expand by five to 10 times its normal size that dissipates it. When the tip of the shape charge jet hits the second plate, the inner plate, after having penetrated the first plate, the outer plate, it triggers an electric current that starts to flow through it. So the incoming munitions act as the electric switch causing large electric currents to flow into it. There, that's the Barney style version without all the math equations that I'll spare you. One of the places I think this would be particularly useful is on top of armored vehicles, where it's difficult to put 1200 millimeters of thick composite armor in places like the turret. But with electric armor, that could theoretically be reduced. So the US Army Research Laboratory in Aberdeen, Maryland, even revealed some of the details of how the components under the hood make up the armor in the new scientist magazine. Your tank would be covered in tiles that are made of plastic, then underneath that you would install a mat of optical fibers, then a thin sheet of armor, then the secret sauce, a bunch of metal coils. In order to find out all of this top secret information on this capability, the first thing I did was go to the War Thunder forums on video games. No, no, no. Actually, I asked you guys on X, formerly Twitter, if you knew where I could dig deeper into electromagnetic armor. Lo and behold, within a few minutes, I had a response from Chad Thunder PhD. Oh, dear God. Chad sent me two PDF files of research papers which were instrumental in the making of this video. So thank you for that, Dr. Now, according to this research paper, they actually live fire tested out electromagnetic armor, quote, with two types of shape charges that were performed in the years of 2005 and 2006 at the Ballistic Research Laboratory of TNO Defense Security and Safety in the Netherlands. They used a weapon that was similar to an RPG-7, like shape charge with a 70 millimeter diameter. According to their preliminary prototype results, when they used 20 kilovolts on their electromagnetic armor, it resulted in reduced penetration of the armor from 100 millimeters without the system to down to 32 millimeters with it turned on. Now, if you think I can't dumb it down, then you've underestimated how dumb I can get. Essentially, the warhead was attacked and zapped with this electricity like those Tesla coils in Command and Conquer. So in theory, tanks using electric armor wouldn't have to weigh 65 tons due to depending on two foot thick armor plates Instead, they would only need to weigh 20 tons. It almost sounds too good to be true, and we'll get into that just shortly. So the paper claimed they proved they could reduce penetration of shape charges by 50 to 70%. There are a few different types of armor, including passive, active, and reactive. This type of armor falls under the category of reactive armor systems that react when the incoming threat touches the outside of the armor tank. So if this concept of electric armor showed so much dang promise, why hasn't it been fully adopted yet? there are likely a number of hurdles that this technology still has to overcome that we'll get into. So the paper notes that the setup required large equipment and long cables and 
A practical solution would need to minimize the length of those cables. The setup to test was also placed a full meter away from the armor, which doesn't sound practical at all to me. However, other major defense companies that you probably recognize are also investigating this idea, most notably BAE Systems from the UK, that reportedly added the armor package onto a combat vehicle demonstrator. They had a cooperative research and development agreement with the US Research Laboratory and the Army's TARDEC. Now, that stands for the US Army Tank Automotive Research Development and Engineering Center. They basically develop, integrate, and sustain technology solutions for all DOD ground vehicle systems. The British military even conducted proof of concept tests and found that the RBG attacks on electromagnetic equipped vehicles left only a few dents on the armor. So Professor Brian James of the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory, who worked on this project for six years, said, quote, but we have found it can be done with surprisingly small amounts of electrical power. This was actually a contradictory point that uh, I found in my research on this topic where some sources claimed it required limited power consumption and other sources reported that the power requirements were too taxing. Brown believed the system would be ready by 2012, but that time has come and gone. So to find out more details about the current state of electric armor, we need to look at this paper here written by BMT Defense Services they state in their unclassified report, however, the integration of these systems in a safe, practical, and cost-effective manner is not without difficulty. Several areas are critical, including A, the requirements for high-density and very rapid response power generation, storage control, and distribution systems. B, the safe integration of mega, amper, pulsed power systems into confined spaces alongside sensitive equipment and crew. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to be sitting next to that thing. Can only imagine what would accidentally happen if I touched the wrong thing while doing maintenance on the vehicle and getting fried to a crisp. D, the robustness and reliability of high energy power systems, components in hostile environments, and the risk to platform survivability in the event of failure. So yeah, if your vehicle runs out of uh, power, then if you get hit, the engine goes down, your armor is useless. The shields are down, we cannot survive another hit. Okay, so it appears like this armor works in perfect lab testing conditions, but when we try to get it to work in the field, in combat environments, it becomes much more expensive, complex, and difficult to pull off. There is also the concern of how effective this type of electromagnetic armor is against armor-piercing fin stabilized discarding Sabo, and similar tank munitions, which has not been thoroughly investigated yet. And that's because incoming shells from enemy main battle tanks use solid pointed chunks of tungsten or depleted uranium in order to punch through your armor, as opposed to copper jets and RPG shape charges that electricity would react with. This means in a near peer environment, it's not as useful. And that's why I think we stopped hearing about electric armor after 2010 when the near peer race started. And we had to worry about fighting other main battle tanks from China. And the reason for this might be because it's more difficult for a ground vehicle's power supply pack to generate and store enough energy to liquefy these larger tank munitions. There's also the fact that currently it has intermittent protection because after it's discharged, there's a recharge cycle that it's dependent on, so it takes time to recharge. And some sources claim that the tank commander needed to turn the system on and off depending on whether or not they expected contact. And there's the question of, how long does it take to charge? Because if you're a quick reaction force and you need to roll out the gates immediately, you can't sit back and say, tell the enemy to wait, I need to charge my armor real quick. The Abrams generates 1,100 kilowatts, the Bradley 450. This means you have to ration that power. Do you wanna send all that power to new technologies like counter UAV laser systems or electric armor? And that's the thing, this entire concept was dreamt up in the early 2000s when the main threat facing armor was RPGs and low intensity warfare in Afghanistan and Iraq. The defense industry was hyper focused on defending against grenade and EFPs. Maybe one day electric armor will be out of the testing phase and adapted successfully into main battle tanks. I think that would be pretty freaking cool. But until then, my guess is that YouTubers like Mark Rober and Backyard Scientist will end up creating electromagnetic armor for a video before any of these defense companies do. And I'd like to give a big shout out to our animator Max, who created all of the original 3D animations that you saw in this video. Okay, so in light of everything I've just shown you about electric armor, the only way the US Department of Defense is able to produce this is thanks to its strategic reserve of rare earth metals, and specifically thanks to its nickel resources. In the past, I've highlighted how the United States hardly mines any rare earth metals themselves in this video here. 
Even though the defense industry uses 750,000 tons of REEs annually. And the only way we're able to continue producing these videos for you is thanks to our sponsors. So I want to take a few minutes to highlight this episode's sponsor, a publicly traded company called Alaska Energy Metals, which just announced major news and it's advancing a nickel project, one of the most critical metals in the defense industry. We use it in the production of everything from body armor to anti-aircraft weapons and armor plating in main battle tanks. In the past couple of years, billionaires Ray Dalio, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Michael Bloomberg, along with Tesla and Samsung, have invested in nickel. And the United States currently only has one single nickel mine. The rest is imported from Indonesia, China, and Russia, which personally I think is something of a national security problem. The supply of nickel to the United States could get cut off at any time in a trade war or in the event of hostilities. So I want to tell you about how this under the radar company is exploring for nickel to domestically mine in America. If you're interested in the logistics side of the defense industry, I think you'll be interested in hearing more about this. In the past two months, a peer company has surged 51%. Soon, China and Indonesia will account for more than 70% of global nickel production, with some coming from the Philippines. What does that mean? Basically, the United States is completely dependent on nickel imports. So in response to this fact, senators and congressmen are also pushing to ban deals with Indonesia and the Philippines because they mine dirty. The Department of Defense issued this press release on September 12, 2023, stating how they're entering into a $20.6 million agreement under the Defense Production Act to strengthen our nickel supply chain. Fact number two, the United States has one nickel mine, and it actually exports that nickel to Canada, which makes Alaska Energy Metals Nickel Project a unique opportunity in the eyes of analyst Ryan Walker of Echelon Capital Markets, who says they're just scratching the surface. Fact number three, in the West, around 65% of the nickel consumed is for stainless steel, super alloys account for 12%, and batteries only make up around 6%. You've seen us talk at length here about how the military is moving towards electric powered infantry squad vehicles and hybrid electric tanks and electric armor, which goes to show just how the demand for nickel is only on the rise. There is on average 29 kilograms of nickel required for each EV passenger car battery, five times as much as lithium. And that's not to mention the need for nickel in grid scale, renewable energy storage solutions, or buses, trucks, and farm equipment, all of which will go electric in the coming decades. Now I'm gonna show you why I wanna bring Alaska Energy Metals to your attention. In the 1990s, one of the largest nickel companies in the world discovered nickel mineralization in Alaska. The project changed ownership a couple of times while $30 million in exploration costs and data collection were gathered. But Greg Beecher, who led the original team that discovered the project, realized that the land was up for grabs and scooped it up for $1.4 million, basically 95% less than the total expenditures made by the previous owners. Since then, the company has been drilling, and they just announced the resource update to the tune of 8.1 billion pounds of nickel. So what's the bottom line? The company Alaska Energy Metals, with its $30 million market cap, is poised for success. And you should be doing additional homework on the company as soon as possible, in my view. Take a look at the red, yellow, and purple areas on the map. Another private company called Cobalt Metals, which specializes in AI-driven resource finding, they recently acquired the Purple Land claim, and the red claims are owned by Alaska Energy Metals. So the site is within walking distance from where an AI-driven mining company just moved. The company's geologists plan to drill the holes shown in yellow in 2024. The idea is that if they hit, it could prove the company's project is world-class. Be sure to do your homework on Alaska Energy Metals, ticker symbol AKEMF, on all major brokerage platforms. I gave you plenty to think about and to consider. Thank you for watching today's episode, Spare Parts Army. I 